Welcome to this talk. I'm feeling very insecure to talk about security uh, because it's the first time ever. So I hope um, it will stuck uh, to you. Uh, and I'll try my best. Anyways, um, so if you have some feedback at the end, I'm very interested uh, as it can develop more then. Uh, but it's brand new, so let's try. Um, oh, and of course, for a brand new talk, you have to have an awesome title. And as a child, I always watched Ghostbusters. And what else? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's great. Only, only two people. Oh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's also here in Spain, right? Okay. And um, I thought they were also very cool because they beat the bad, guy, the bad guys, but it was never boring. Um, so while beating all the ghosts, they always had these awesome suits and they had these awesome adventures. Um, and it was totally different for me than um, experiencing uh, security, because security for me was always like the most boring thing. It was more like, what's the, 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 the rabbit called? A uh, manchi, um, I don't know if you know it. But like very boring mythy, yeah. Um, like very boring cartoon. And I thought, well, it can't be true that we're keeping it this boring. So this is what the talk is about. Try to get it in the DevOps themes. Try to make it interesting instead of boring. So I hope it works. Um, first, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm Kim. Um, I'm head of, head of IT at Anva. There are three of the people from Anva here, so that's very cool. <laughs> they will applaud with every slide that comes, but they already forgot the first time. So you're doing a terrible job. <laughs> and, <laughs> Um, and I was head of IT at Grafenkopfverzekering, it's an insurance company in Holland. Uh, I have done that for a few years. Uh, before that I was on the business side always uh, as a product owner or a project manager or stuff like that. Um, so um, somewhere near IT but not actually in IT. Um, and I'm very proud, I'm starting programming in 2018, so that's this year. I can build my own two applications. <laughs> And I'm having incredible much fun because um, I'm actually taking a deep dive into the uh, into IT, which is much more cooler than doing it from uh, from the side. And there are some handles. So, yeah, I'm also writing a book together with Sander, who speaks after me in the other hall, um, and we're doing a talk together also tomorrow. So yeah, that's not enough introduction. So something about Anta, the company I work with, um, I work for right now. It's a uh, software insurance company. So they build software for the full chain of insurance. So the intermediary, the financial advisors, the insurance companies itself. So it's for the full chain of insurance. And um, this is a, a nice little statistic thing. We have a team of 60 developers and we have 37 languages. Uh, so that's kind of a tough situation. You have to do anything with us, right? <laughs> and if you look at the count, we have like 10 million lines of COBOL still, and we're migrating towards this microservice platform, uh, and we're um, uh, having a lot of fun doing that, I guess, because we're moving towards this very modern landscape, but also trying to deal with legacy issues, as is any company in the world, I guess. So, uh, very basically the same as all you hear. Um, and, um, well, then the first question for me, why focus on security? Because that's new to me. Uh, before I was focusing on all the cool stuff like immutable infrastructure and continuous delivery and uh, having new organizations, new management styles, new HR and all those kind of things. Um, so for me this was always a moment where someone made, uh, scheduled an appointment with me and who he was a security officer and I thought, okay, can I take a day off or something? I would just reschedule, reschedule, it's terrible. Um, so uh, for me it's very out of the box to focus exactly on security. So I'd like to tell you why, because maybe you'll just recognize it and maybe you'll follow the same path. Um, so as I said, it was boring, draining and worthless. And what I found is all those things I had found boring and draining and worthless all those years, they weren't just boring. They were boring for a reason, because they weren't adding enough value to me. <laughs> Anything that's really adding value um, somehow grabs your, grabs your interest, right? It never stays boring when it's actually doing something for your company. So it was kind of a signal. And I've learned uh, along the years to listen more carefully to the signal. So why was it boring? People from security were asking me questions like, do you lock your screen? And it seemed like kind of a, a weird question because we are in an office like this one, very open. And anyone can see 
the screen. So there is not some kind of foreign intruder who actually comes and hack the full system. Um, or there were questions like, do you clean your whiteboards? Because we have a clean desk policy. Then we are like, no, of course we don't clean our whiteboards. There's valuable information on the whiteboards, so we can't clean them. That's not what, meant, that's not what they meant to do, right? Um, and it was hardly ever about code. It was hardly ever about real security. It was more about paper security. And actually, hackers don't use paper to get into your systems, right? They actually use code to get into, to get into your system. So I thought, well, we should change this. Um, and for me, it always felt like there was kind of a security role play. So the security officer asked a lot of questions. I answered a lot of questions. Some of the people from the team uh, answered a lot of questions. And at the end, uh, mostly because they weren't coders themselves, they weren't native from IT or something, they were satisfied, more or less, with the answers we were giving them. And then they went away. And we were like, OK, that's good. Next year, next round. Um, We've had that, and that's not any, that's not of any value. So we should really change this. Um, so I thought, okay, um, it should not ever be performed by non-engineers, um, and it should not ever be only about paper. It should be about code. Um, and then there was this other development. Uh, we were all stepping deep dive into continuous delivery, right? Is there anyone not doing continuous delivery or agile at this current stage? Anyone who dares to raise his hand, it's very, very confident of you. I mean, most of the people are stepping into this hype. Because it's, uh, when, when I asked this question about two years ago, who is, who is doing continuous delivery? There was one hand, one hand raised, now it's the other way around. When I ask people who isn't doing continuous delivery, there's one, one hand raised. So, everybody is focusing on speed. Everybody is going faster. But in this speed, everything is about speed and not and about speed only. So where did architecture go? Where did security modeling go? They just kind of vanished. So we're taking big risks over here. And maybe we should have some focus on security and on proper uh, evolutionary architectures and stuff like that. Um, but on the other hand, it felt for me like I was the little gnome over there. We went to Poland earlier this year in, in, in Rochdale. They have all these gnomes. It's awesome. And I, I felt like I was the, the guy over there. Like, go away. I don't want to talk about security. Anyways. <laughs> and then all these signals were arriving. Like, okay, we have GDPR. Everybody is doing GDPR at this moment, right? Because it's almost there. End of May. We are all screwed. And um, <laughs> yeah, basically that's what it <laughs> says. Like, and um, there was this conference where I saw this statement um, and uh, the girl said, okay, we did a research and we asked people in DevOps teams, are you confident that you know enough about security to actually code security? And fewer than half of developers are saying, yes, I feel confident that I'm delivering properly secure code. I'm wondering here, how many of you are confident that you're delivering properly secure code? That's very good. Okay, just for the video, that's two people. That's, that's really very little. And the rest of us is, is, is relying on hope, right? And hope is not really a very good te technical choice when it comes to security. That's what Sam Newman said about a year ago, which was also one of those signals that stuck in my head. Like, okay, I'm trusting on hope. That's really very bad. And cloud computing totally is changing the world, right? I mean, we have very different risks. And we are using all these tools, all these open source um, software uh, elements, and we actually are sometimes using something that's very immature. And we don't look at, is it properly tested? Is it properly, um, uh, has it, does it have a community that's big enough to fix vulnerabilities in time? Things like that are not the choices we are focusing on. We are focusing on, okay, this piece of open source software is helping me to deliver my story tomorrow. That's the main question we ask. <coughs> and that's not enough. And um, <coughs> security is just not a core competence of developers. This was uh, conducted in a security uh, analysis of Gartner, and they had a review uh, about what knowledge do developers have and how is it distributed in the, in the teams. And there are a lot of teams where knowledge of security is absent. Which is also quite striking. And hacking just gets easier, much easier. I was very scared to see this program where you could just tick some boxes and then you could say, okay, create. 
and then you can just run it against the domain and it will attack the domain, probably successfully. It's just as easy as this. And there are all these script kiddies. This is the son of one of our engineers. Um, and, well, there's this big button launch and you can just launch all these scripts. And it feels like kind of stupid, right? If there are scripts out there and board teams can just run them and your systems are actually vulnerable against those scripts, you feel like a fool, right? It happens. Because it can't be that a teenager outruns you in security. Because it, that feels like it's too easy. It feels like it's a kind of competition. And you, want to, you don't want to lose it this way, right? So we have to do it kind of different. And then look at, look, look at passwords. I mean, just firewalls won't keep you safe. Because uh, that's the thing we, we think. Like, it's kind of a myth. We have a firewall. It will protect us against anything, right? Because we have a firewall. Well, it won't, because it's very easy to come inside the system. You can come inside through open source software, for instance, vulnerability to third parties, but you can also come inside just through a password. I mean, almost 11% of passwords is one of the top 20 passwords. It's terrible. People are just not creative enough to, to invent a password that di that's different from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 or something. So, it's very easy to enter a system, and then if you're not protecting behind the firewall, you'll probably have a headache later. So I thought, okay, let's go all into security. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it full, fully, and I'm going to make it creative, and I'm going to make it about code. So that's what I did. Um, so I thought, okay, let's just read something about it. Um, so I started with continuous delivery, because I do some talks about that, and it's one of the topics that's of great passion to me. And continuous delivery is about being able to safely deliver incremental changes to customers. Um, and to do that in such a way that you can actually have it with um, uh, acceptable costs and risk and time, right? So it shouldn't be very hard to deliver incremental change, otherwise it won't be possible to actually deliver incremental change. So I took this definition and I made my own, because somehow I was really scared that, that I looked all over the internet that there is no definition of DevSecOps, there's no Wikipedia page of DevSecOps yet, <laughs> and there's no definition of continuous security yet. And that's kind of terrible. So I tried something, it probably is not flawless, um, but I think continuous security is a set of practices and principles in software engineering aimed at designing, developing, and releasing software more securely. Um, these prin principles will help you reduce the time cost and risk of designing, scanning, testing and monitoring security and help you deliver integrity, availability and data protection of applications in production. And um, what's important in the definition is um, that it's not just about data protection because if you look at the definition of security, it's also about integrity and availability. You also have to be able to trust the data in your system. It's not only about keeping it inside your system. Um, and you have to be able to reach the data in your system. Otherwise, you're, um, you're not delivering uh, the system. People depend on it, so they will feel very insecure if they're not able to reach the system. So a DDoS attack actually um, falls within the definition of security of this. Um, well, if you look at Gardner, um, they have this report, State of the uh, DevOps, DevSecOps report, um, and they say, okay, right now we are at the bottom of the hype cycle. Only 10% of people is doing DevSecOps already, and they are predicting in 2021 that up to 80 or 90% will be doing DevSecOps because everybody will be, will be um, investing in security um, greatly. So if you're not there yet, then I hope you will walk along with the baby steps we've taken. We're not there yet, but it's just how we get started. Um, so, how did we start? Because I was somewhere, somewhere some, um, maybe, this is the director of the company, which is a nice story, but not about this talk. Uh, but he was losing control over all the teams. He said, I don't know what's happening anymore. So he just sat in the middle of the teams, uh, because he wanted to know what they were doing. <laughs> so it, it was didn't nice. help. It didn't help, no, no, no. I know, but it was nice to see him sit there, because 
Uh, it was for me, it was about the path to autonomy, which is a good thing. Um, and for me, now it felt like I was sitting there because I had this, I realized that, okay, we need to do more about security, but at that point, not alone. So I thought, okay, let's, do it, let's try to do this the right way, right? So um, I'm talking all the time about self-organization and I said, okay, um, this is what's important to people. Uh, responsibility, shared vision, uh, recognition, autonomy. And that's a hard thing to reach inside your current business because um, uh, transition is hard. Most people will be in this transition, so you know it's hard, right? Um, and I thought, well, uh, this is a nice opportunity. Besides from delivering security, it's also a nice opportunity to break with the common patterns in our company and to actually try something new. Um, so we did that and um, I said, okay, um, I um, uh, started a security satellite team. These are a bunch of people, one of them is sitting over there. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'm going to have five developers, uh, which were an architect, uh, two developers and two testers. Although uh, the testers also code and the people, the developers also test, so it's not just a very role, it's a very strictly, strictly role-based, uh, sort of. And um, three operation guys. Um, and um, this, this is also funny because this is the architect, this is the developer, this is the tester. Uh, this is an operation guy and this is a system administrator. And they're working very closely together on security stories. And um, I think um, it is one of the best examples in the company where people are actually uh, having full autonomy and actually can do their thing. Uh, starting with a vision like, okay, we're exposing customer data over an open source cloud platform in about half a year, make sure we can do that safely. Because we have a big market share, so practically the personal data of every Dutchman will be exposed within half a year. So try to fix it or something. And it was very cool because I did nothing <laughs> and you did everything, right? <laughs> I just sat there and watched. And that was, that was so cool to me because there was also uh, a way to uh, if you're having trouble to implement DevOps at your company, you can also see it as a starting point to actually achieve this. Because for security, you have to work together uh, between developers and operations, otherwise you just won't get there. Um, and we took this security uh, maturity model and we said, okay, where are we right now? Because we don't want to get uh, full-blown security and get uh, headaches over the amount of information, so let's just start small. And um, we thought, okay, we are somewhere between here and here. And then this graph strike, uh, struck me uh, because it said, okay, there's a high effort to actually make the step to the next level of security. Let's zoom in on that. Um, we actually said, okay, let's just start small. We didn't know what we were doing, we just started. And um, we said, okay, let's have a security board. And all these stories were put on there, so it looks like this. Uh, and we said, okay, we're going to research set, we're going to do research uh, BD security, which is behavioral driven uh, um, design, and then the security framework, which has stories uh, to test security, just like the given when then uh, structure. Um, and we have all these kind of stories over here. Um, looking back, I learned a lot, so let's just skip to the part. Um, so let's play. Oh, the resolution is very good. Um, well, to give you some um, uh, coordination on how to go to, uh, to implement this process, uh, Gartner has developed uh, a, a top 10 of steps you should take when you want to implement DevSecOps in your company. Uh, there are two I left um, away because they were kind of, well, they struck me as strange because one of them is have continuous integration because you have to be able to uh, see any time the code changes. I think that's very important, but that's not just important for security. I mean, if you're not there yet, you should focus on that before you go to DevSecOps, right? And the other one is, if you make tests, um, you should actually be able uh, to have them into version control and to maintain them just the same as code. That's also a very obvious one for me, so I just left those up. Uh, I want to focus on that one. Um, so, uh, the first, first of them is have security champions. Um, for me, the security champions uh, is the set security satellite team. That's a team of eight people who will focus on security together and who will um, try to um, spread the fire of passion of, of 
interest uh, to the rest of the teams because security has to be part of the work of the teams. It shouldn't be something that's aside from the team. Um, and uh, don't try to eliminate all risk. That's also a very important one. Um, then uh, it should be driven by DevOps teams. Um, you have to identify and remove first. And I'll get into this all later. Um, you have to adapt your SAS and your desk. Uh, somehow security always uses four letter acronyms. So maybe that's because it's different than software engineering, because there's all these three letter acronyms, right? And um, you have to eliminate known vulnerabilities, train DevOps for the basis, and uh, look at immutable infrastructures. So, um, first of all, don't try to eliminate the worst. Uh, it's the same thing as with testing, right? You can't test the full system. It's the same thing with developing features. You can't deliver all the features. Because you get lost in the amount of features you should build and the amount of tests you should run. And security isn't different. That's one of the main things that bothered me when speaking to a security officer. Uh, it somehow seemed as if they didn't have a notice of um, risk acceptance at some level, right? So, when you start doing DevSecOps, don't try to eliminate all the risk. Just prioritize, just as any other thing in software engineering. Otherwise, um, it will just get too big to actually push up the mountain like this picture. Um, so, how can you do this? Uh, well, just simply do the same thing as with testing. Um, look at the things uh, that are of high risk, do them sooner, and try to have them as soon as possible in your pipeline. And all the things that are lower risk, you can do them later in your pipelines because it won't matter if the feedback comes a little bit later because they are low risk. So you don't expect any negative impact, right? And there are also things that are just too expensive due to the duration or the maintenance of the tests. So don't do them. Or look into monitoring. Is it something you can spot through monitoring? And maybe that's enough if it's not mission critical. And that's the thing you should always have as a sort of measure when you are thinking about implementing security tests. Um, then uh, it should be driven by DevOps teams. So um, make it about automation. And everything we do uh, about security, let's try to automate it first. Because that's repeatable. And that's um, enabling us to deliver implemented change, right? That's the same thing as with continuous delivery. And um, so we looked at all the things we can actually automate. Uh, and try to seek as many as possible, because everything done manually will be a, an obstacle to deliver your system, or will be a risk, eventually. Um, so then, identify and remove first. That's a basic step. Um, your system already has enough vulnerabilities, so don't try to have um, a session where you can break the system in as many ways as possible. Just try to identify some and learn. That's the easiest way to just get started and to grow awareness. And every step you take, you're making the system more safe. Um, so what we did, we adopted a SAST and a DOST. Um, SAST is about static uh, application security testing. Um, and this is about examining your source code. So we know a lot of those systems already. I mean, most people know so many, right? Um, check marks, find set box, PMD, fortify, extend, cast, and coverity are all examples of SAST scanners who will examine your code. Um, and the benefit of it is that you get very early feedback on uh, these kind of examinations um, because you can run them uh, actually before you have run your application. So you can run them uh, on every commit or even uh, pre commit, you can already run them. Um, and you get de detailed information on where you have screwed up because you can actually point uh, the very um, uh, place in the code where you have um, uh, broken the rule, right? Um, so that's very good. But there are also some downsides, serious downsides, so this is definitely not enough to uh, rely on. And the downside is that you get a lot of false positives and a lot of false negatives. So that means. Uh, there was also in the graph from Gartner, you have to adapt your SAST because out of the box will give you a lot of work because the false positives will give you a lot of work because the developers have to sort out if they are false positives and false negatives means you're relying on something you can't rely on. Uh, both is bad, right? <coughs> um, and then you have DOS. This is a dynamic application security testing. Um, and examples, the most um, uh, solid example is ZOP. 
which is a Z tech proxy. I will explain a little bit more about it later. Uh, Burp, uh, Arachne, uh, I don't know, W3AF, Fortify, Scan, and Akun. Um, there are also combinations of the two scanners, and it's called I, IAST, and so IAST or something. Um, but um, to make things clear, it's better to separate them uh, at this moment. Um, and the dynamic application security tester um, will examine your code on runtime. So it will actually try to um, attack your application, treating it as a black box, and try to attack it. Uh, for instance, through proxy servers, or through um, uh, fuzzing, or through uh, you know, trying to uh, hack it as a hacker would, right? Because he will attack the source code, he will actually attack the application. Um, together with the SAS, you can actually benefit from early feedback and um, have complete overview uh, of security of your application. So actually you should combine them. Uh, but if you find something, if you get a negative, uh, well, it will be harder to track where it came from. So it will, uh, it will cost you a lot more work, right? So that's one of the downsides of it. Um, and um, one of the other downsides is it requires a running instance. So it will extend to the moment where you have this running instance. For some companies, if you're not doing computer security, that might take a while, right? Um, well, <laughs> um, then you should actually adopt, uh, adapt your uh, SAS and your DAST. Um, uh, for instance, we use Sonar, and Dominique is sitting over there. He, uh, he just simply did it. He said, okay, I'm going to uh, add all the security rules because previously we just um, we, we uh, deleted them from the set of things we were checking against because we weren't really understanding what they were saying. So he said, okay, I'm putting them all on again. I'm trying to find what it says. And he said, okay, I've implemented 100 security rules in Sonar. And he sent the top security issues to each developer. Um, and the developers all responded and said, okay, I'm going to fix these. Which was a very quick step because we were working a week or something on this subject. And within a week, this was already a huge benefit, which is cool. It already gained awareness, it already gained a real result. Um, and we're also looking into uh, the dynamic uh, application security testing. Uh, we chose SAP because it, was, it is an OWASP uh, flagship project. It has a lot of potential, it's open source, so it's really um, within a lot of the restrictions we are choosing uh, within our landscape. Um, and it's very broad. That's also, for me, it's the biggest downside. It's so big that it's hard to understand somehow. Um, but it can do almost anything for you. And it has different layers, so it can help an expert, but it can also help a beginner. And Z will also help you to actually uh, manually do a penetration test on your systems because it will allow you access in a more easy way to a lot of layers where you want to test your application. So that's very good to adopt into your systems. Um, let's see. Um, well, what we also did was an OWASP dependency check. It was also very easy to put on. Uh, was, I think it was the same week as where you said uh, we're going to do this sonar check against the old security rules. Uh, one of the testers, he just added the, the, the dependency check. Uh, and dependency checks, we all know that's right. Um, we use a lot of third party software, a lot of open source software in cloud computing. It's just um, getting more and more. Um, and there are some databases, uh, the National Vulnerability Database and the, the National Weakness Database, um, and they expose the known vulnerabilities and the known weaknesses of all the third-party software available. And you can just check against it. You don't have to program it yourself. You can just um, ask Sonar to do this for you. So that was a very easy step. Really, within a week, I think it was working within a day, but just took us a week to... Two days. Two days. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, and um, it just took us a week to figure out we had to do that. It was very easy to do. We found 550 vulnerabilities, and it was not a full uh, scan of our full landscape. This was just a new platform we were building. And already a new platform, which was built really to, we had 550 um, vulnerabilities, which is not. And uh, the benefit was, it was also fixed within two hours or something. <laughs> because they updated some of the dependencies. Uh, they deleted some of the dependencies that just weren't necessary. Um, and it grew a lot of awareness because, because now on every commit, we check against the known vulnerabilities. Which is also kind of the thing you don't want to explain to the outside world. Like, 
okay, we have no vulnerability in our systems, we just left it in there for half a year, we ignored it, and now your data is breached. Sorry? I mean, I don't really like the press conference where you have to tell people you did this. So this is something you should just check in your systems, because it will be too easy to actually hack your system in this way. Um, so now we actually have step security checks in our pipelines, uh, which was added due to this um, to this configuration. This is in the rules, not on the platform. And uh, you just get uh, a built uh, feedback uh, on the known vulnerabilities. So for us at Sonar, but a lot of application uh, security test scanners I mentioned have them, and you probably have some implemented in your um, in your company already. So just put them on. It's very little work to do so. Um, but then we're not there yet. Uh, it's kind of like this. You have, um, there was a new insight to me. You have two sides to security. I was thinking, okay, um, when I went all into security, I thought, okay, I'm going to automate everything, so I, I'll never be bothered by security again. That was kind of the purpose. Uh, and that won't work, which was kind of a downside, but you also get a challenge back for it, because the other side is quite interesting, actually. So you can automate a lot, and you should, because you don't want to be vulnerable against the things the teams can actually use to exploit your system. So that's everything I talked about is about automating. But then there's the other side, and that's uh, about logical flaws. So those are the things you can automate against. These are just um, uh, wrongs in your thinking, and these wrongs are um, exposing you to threat. For instance, we have a Microsoft platform. And, um, of course, everything in communication goes through RESTful APIs. Um, and there's um, a JSON, which has a lot of data. Um, if, I would, um, if I would change the JSON and add, for instance, a social security number, which can't be exposed anywhere, right? Um, I don't see where it's all uh, used. And the application using it won't break due to the extra piece of information because it's been where you want it to accept, right? So that's an easy way to have a data breach where you add some kind of data to your JSON, the other side just accepts it, and maybe it's not behind any login information or something, or maybe it's not suitable for the user seeing it over there. But it is there in the browser, obviously. So those are the kind of things that you would call a logical flaw, where just your thinking wasn't complete. You have to also protect against this and test against it. Well, there's part of it which you can automate, because every time there is a logical flaw, you can choose to uh, have a test script uh, to make sure you never make this mistake again. That's something you can do, and you can just write test scripts with a given then when structure. Um, but you won't fully be protected against it. So you have to think of another way to actually achieve security on that part of the system, because hackers will also exploit this part. The good news is, um, these are not a script kitty anymore, because logical flaws are more um, complex to find, right? So actually someone will be very different, uh, uh, deliberately attacking your system at the point where your, um, where your security is flawed against these kind of patterns. Um, what we also did, we took the application security verification standard, which is also one of the OWASP Plus flagship projects, um, and it's pages and pages full of best practices. It's terrible. This is really the main example of paper security. It's like 65 pages of rules you should actually follow as a developer. Nobody can learn this by heart, right? Because it's just too much. So what we're doing is for every check we are seeing, uh, is it relevant for our situation? Because a lot of them can just um, be gone because it isn't relevant in our setting. Um, we're looking which one can we automate through the sauce, through the dust, through rust, which is um, another form. Uh, uh, maybe I'll get into it later. Uh, or maybe another way, through custom-made uh, scripts for against regression. And then we can condense the full list into three pages which are actually something we can train developers on. Because you can't train someone on 65 pages, it's terrible. Um, so that's something you can actually consider to do for your company. Um, and training is also very important. It was also in the Gartner 10 step uh, program. They said train for the basics. Um, so we now, at every um, uh, uh, internal academy um, session or conference session, we internally train our own developers and the security satellite teams 
uh, takes the initiative to actually tell people something about how they should code securely. Um, and the other um, thing to grow awareness is we're looking into hack yourself first, and I have um, crossed the first because we probably won't be the first, right? Uh, but hack yourself too. Let's make it about them. Um, and this is kind of practice from cloud, from chaos engineering. Um, I think Ross Miles will be telling something about it later at the conference um, because he knows a lot about uh, chaos engineering. Uh, chaos engineering is the discipline to actually make a rare event very um, uh, unrare. <laughs> Let's just say it like that. <laughs> um, to make sure, because um, we're thinking we're protected against kind of rare scenarios, but if you never test them in production, you're not sure, right? And it's very, well, let's say it's attractive to developers to break some rule if speed is uh, it's the matter, right? So if you don't regularly test your applications against these rare events, you never know if you're certain against it. Um, so for us this was, uh, for me, this is the same thing with security. If you're not checking against security yourself, then the event will be too rare. And once it happens, uh, May, most companies actually go out of business due to security events. So it's a critical business risk. You don't want to be exposed to such a risk without doing anything against it. Um, so uh, what we said is, well, this is the system administrator guy, this is his photo, uh, which already stipulates that he's a hacker, an ethical hacker for uh, professionals, so it's something he just does in his free time. And he successfully hacks the government. He also got a t-shirt for him. Um, but I uh, am planning on educating the rest of the satellite team to actually be able to uh, hack ourselves. So that every month we have a regular hacking session and we'll try to um, grow awareness from the fact that we're finding uh, vulnerabilities in our systems every month. Making it an unrare event. Making it something um, where we're not uh, exposed to all kinds of risks and not knowing anything about it. Kind of like chaos engineering. Um, you can also look at evil user stories, sometimes they're called abuser stories, I don't like the term, I like this one, um, where you actually um, have custom scripts, like as a malicious hacker, I want to gain access to this web application's cloud hosting account so that I can lock out the legitimate, legitimate owners who need the servers and their backups to destroy their entire business. This is something that actually happened to a company and they went out of business. Um, so you could actually try to test against these evil user stories and make sure they actually go green uh, so that you're um, uh, proven to be protected against these kind of mistakes. Um, and lastly, in the garden top 10 steps, you have the immutable infrastructure uh, where you say, okay, once the infrastructure is there, hands off. So everybody can go to sleep or something. It was very hard to find a cross picture for this. Um, <laughs> and, um, because uh, as long as people are manually adapting uh, the infrastructure, there are new risks, and it's not possible to scan at that point in time against those new risks, because it's not possible to track them. So you have to have minimal infrastructure to make sure that your scans throughout the pipelines are still valid in production, and won't be um, screwed up by someone who just misconfigures something in the system. That's also a risk you don't want to take. So let's just wrap it up. I think it's a little bit short for a talk. Well, um, uh, so Garbage of 10 steps, you have to have those security champions. So you can look at the small group which will uh, lead the way for the rest of the company. Um, but make sure they are not the only ones doing security. That's something we focus very much on. Uh, every time we find a vulnerability, we ask the team to fix it themselves. Because it can't be a task from just a small set of people. It should be a um, uh, uh, thing the whole group of engineers and operation guys uh, is able to do, to execute. Uh, don't try to eliminate all the risk. Um, make sure it comes from within the DevOps teams. Um, identify and remove first, so just focus on delivering early value uh, because it will prove the necessity of implementing a DevSecOps culture. Uh, adapt your SaaS and your DAS to make sure you're not getting too much false positives, too much false negatives. Uh, eliminate your known vulnerabilities, so do your dependency check. Um, train your DevOps for the basics. Um, make sure you don't want to have everybody as a security expert. Most people just want to focus on coding. This can also be about coding, but don't try to make this the only thing important in the company. And make sure you have a mutable infrastructure so that you can rely on your tests 
and that they are still valid in production. So that was the talk. I think I actually, for the first time, I have time for questions. <laughs> Here are some references, and I have a lot of sources if you want to read more about it. So thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> 